what dance, 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 what motion, what, motion, what kind what of a symphony, kind of symphony, 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 symphony because basically all, basic, all basic, phenomena of life are music, 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 music and uh, gold differs from lead in exactly the same way that a waltz differs from a mazurka. It's a different dance. And there isn't any thing that's dancing. That is a deception we get into because we have two parts of speech in our grammar. We have nouns and verbs. And verbs are supposed to describe the activities of nouns. And this is simply a convention of speech. You could have a language with only verbs in it. You don't need any nouns, or you could also have a language with the nouns only and no verbs. And uh, it would perfectly adequately describe what's going on in the world. So if you were used to speaking with a, part, with a language that had one part of speech, uh, you could say just as much as we can with two and be a lot clearer. Only at first it would sound awkward, but you'd soon get used to it. And then when you got used to it, it would be a matter of common sense that the patterning of the world is not some kind of stuff that's patterning. You don't have to seek for a substance underlying the whole thing, it's just patterning. And we're all that. And wherever you see patterning, you will see the principle that big fleas have little fleas upon their backs to bite them, little fleas have lesser fleas and so ad infinitum. And then you reverse the process, see? Little fleas, in, infinite, infinitely little fleas, are always on the back of bigger fleas. And those bigger fleas are on the back of still bigger ones. And those bigger fleas are on the back of still more whopping fleas, you see. It goes the other way too. And so in this way, uh, there is, to a person who really wakes up, you very soon realize that your existence is not something that is just the uh, hopeless little creature that's suddenly confronted with a great big external world that goes Gah! at him, you know, and eats him up. Every tiniest little thing that comes into being, every minute little fruit fly or gnat or bacterium, I will go so far as to say, is an event upon which this whole cosmos depends. This thing goes both ways. It's not only that every little organism which exists depends on its total environment. The reverse is also true, that the total environment depends on each and every one of those little organisms. So that you could say, this universe consists of a, an arrangement of pattern, in which every event is essential to the whole thing. Now, we screen that idea out of our consciousness in exactly the same way that we screen out the perception of space as an important reality. Just as we pay attention to the figure and ignore the background, so we see one way of looking at things, mainly, that the organism is very frail against the environment. It lasts a long time, the environment, but the organism only lasts a short time. What do you mean the environment lasts a long time? What does the environment consist of? Just a lot of little things. And yet there is the environment just as the same way as there is the face in the newspaper photograph behind all those little dots. When you get far enough away from it, you see the face. When you get far enough away from all the organisms and the little bits of things, you see the environment in another scale of magnification. But actually, uh, the whole thing is arranged in a, a polar system where the enormous depends on the tiny and the tiny depends on the enormous. And you get a relationship between these extremes which can be called a transaction. That is to say, a transaction when there's buying and selling it's impossible to have buying without selling and selling without buying. They always go together. But of course, the person you see who's interested in buying thinks more about buying than he thinks about the other fellow selling. And if he does that, he's going to get a bad buy. Because he doesn't really think about the mechanisms the other fellow's using to sell. And if I want to sell something and think too much about selling, I don't 
enter sufficiently into the psychology of the buyer. So then I'm not a good, uh, not a good business shark. So in this way, we are always, as it were, overemphasizing a certain aspect of our experience. And we say now, what is important about people? This is the great credo of the West. Is there a unique individuality? And we have been given an immense psychic investment in our own individuality by our upbringing. What are you going to amount? What are you going to contribute to human life? What's your particular destiny going to be? It's a fine idea. But the thing we don't understand is that it won't work, this great idea, without being balanced with its opposite. Just as you can't have the back without the front. So you cannot have the values of a unique personality Unless at the same time, everybody recognizes that uh, there is another level at which we are not unique at all, but that I am you and you are I. That in other words, the so-called I that we all have, you see, every one of you feels that you're the center of the universe and that everything else is happening around you in a circle. You can turn around and uh, you can see sort of equally far in all directions, especially if you're in a ship in the middle of the ocean. So you're in the middle. And it's true from the standpoint of astronomy. We live in a curved space-time continuum, that is to say in a universe at which every point may be regarded as the center. Consider a sphere. Here's a ball. What point on this ball is the center of its surface? You can see at once that any point can be the center of its surface. So legitimately, all points in the universe are the center. That's St. Bonaventure's description of God, that circle whose center is everywhere and whose circumference is nowhere. So everybody's in that situation. And at that depth of your existence, we are all like um, the nerve ends on your own skin. See, at every point on your skin, there's a little nerve end going peak and getting information from the outside world. Another and another and another, all over. And they all constitute your total sensitivity. Well, so in the same way, and all these people sitting around here, with their little eyes and little ears and things, they're going peak. And they're all really one common center, called I, which is looking at itself from ever so many different points of view. Only, we are so close to it, and we are so absorbed in the different ways each one of them is doing, that we neglect the community underneath. If, if in other words, someone from an entirely different form of biology came to this planet and looked at us, he wouldn't know the difference between Negroes uh, Greeks, Armenians, and uh, white Anglo-Saxon Protestants. Uh, they would all look to him exactly the same. And he would see us as, uh, in, in other words, he'd look at a group like this here, and he would call it a thing. You know, just as you see a set of false teeth, and they all are pretty much alike, and you say, well, that's a set of false teeth. So you see a set of people sitting around. And uh, say, well, that's a, that's a thing. It's like a caterpillar with so many legs on it, you know. Oh, it breaks up and uh, reforms and so on. It's rather interesting. It's like hydras, you know. You can take hydras and put them in an osterizer. Having taught, no, flatworms, excuse me. You can take flatworms and you can teach them certain tricks. And then you put them in an osterizer and uh, pulverize them. And then they reform themselves and they know the tricks you taught them. And you can mix up those who do and those who don't. And those who do learn the tricks and can convey it to the new ones uh, that didn't know them, see? So that maybe one day we can um, get some DNA from uh, genius people and feed it to people who don't know anything. And immediately they learn these tricks. Think of that. But the, the meaning of all that, talking about DNA and osterized flatworms, is that um, 
what is transmitted all the time is the repetition of pattern, the repetition of certain rhythms. And that this whole uh, rhythmic system may be looked at in this way. Let's just take any pattern. Uh, we, we can form a pattern, say, of um, like this. See? I make a kind of a loop, en a loop ended cross in the air. Now, let's consider what is the problem involved in analyzing that pattern into smaller parts. Uh, shall I say each one of these loops is a part, and there are four parts, therefore, to the pattern? Well, where does a loop begin and end? Just excuse me, let's look at it another way. I could say that not this was a part, but this was a part of the pattern. And were four of those. Uh, you should all study, incidentally, the drawings of a great Dutch artist by the name of Escher whose uh, work appeared a little while ago in the Scientific American, but he has a book of the most fantastic patterns where you will see, for example, an arrangement of devils. And when you look at the background, it's an arrangement of angels. That er everything goes with its counterpoint. So that the, when you look at one of Escher's pictures, you don't know which is the foreground and which is the background. You just flip, 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 and you can have it either way. Well, everything's like that. Only because, as I said, we are fascinated with what we have at the moment selected as the foreground. We say, four! Foreground! It comes before. It's important. That's what's there, the background. Oh, that's just background, you see? But supposing you suddenly do a flip on that, and you realize the foreground, yeah, it's kind of close, but as we say of people, you could only see the trees, you can't see the forest. It's like businessmen who say they're very practical, but they're very short-sighted and don't know what's good for them. They put themselves out of their business regularly so they have to start wars in order to carry on business. And, uh, you know, that's stupid. So you, you always, wherever you are looking at the general panorama of sensory experience, Try switching. Try shifting your attention to all the things you thought were unimportant, to the constants, to the background. And begin looking at the spaces between people. Uh, all painters have to learn this, because especially if you are working in oils, you actually have to paint in the background. Weavers know this. Because when they're making patterns in weaving, they've got to weave the background as well. Or if you do needlepoint with embroidery, think of the hours you spend putting in the background over the canvas in wool. And you become aware of it. Same way the people who made the, the great oriental carpets. They're much more aware of the background as constituting an essential part of the total experience. So as you uh, become aware of this, you will see the same thing that you notice in music, namely that it is only as a result of hearing the interval between tones that you hear any melody. If you don't hear the interval, you're tone deaf, and all notes are the same noise. All you hear is rhythm. You don't hear any melody. You've got to hear the interval. So then watch the intervals between people. The things that aren't said, the things that are tacit, the things that are implicit rather than explicit in all life. And then you begin to get um, connected. You know, it's very important to have a connection in life. And um, to be in the know. And uh, this is the way it, it, it fundamentally comes out. Of seeing the thing you forgot. You know, you can always bug people in a beautiful way, in a very helpful way, by just saying to them, what did you forget? I say, well, I don't know. Uh, what was I supposed to remember? Oh, I'm, not, I'm, I'm really not trying to put you on. Uh, I mean, it's not difficult. This is something completely obvious that you forgot. You, you'd easily remember it because it's so obvious. 
Well, that's the hardest thing in the world to think of. What's the most obvious thing I forgot? Oh, what's that? Well, who do you think you are? Well, how do you answer that question? Who are you? Well, you give a name. You say, I'm Joe Dokes, I'm Alan Watts. That's not true. That's what people told you you were. They put that name on you and they taught you to identify with it and to behave as it was expected to behave. But that's not who you are. You know very well. Go back in your memory. Go back into your infancy before they started telling you all this stuff. Who are you? And if you get with that, you'll know uh, very well who you are. The jolly old ancient of days. Only there's a conspiracy that you mustn't let on about that because everybody is. And uh, if one person realizes it, the other's a little bit offended. And they say, well, uh, how come you're so great? Uh, we worked it in Christianity by a very clever thing of allowing just one individual to be recognized as the God incarnate. And uh, nobody else therefore could be, and since he had been safely crucified and whisked up to heaven, uh, he wouldn't bother us anymore. So everybody, therefore, who gets an intimation of who they really are and ever comes out with it in Christian civilization, people say, who the hell do you think you are? Are you Jesus Christ? Well, you can say Jesus Christ said he was Jesus Christ and everybody put him down for it and that's what you're doing to me. Oh, they say, forget that one. Because uh, it's like uh, somebody comes out and composes some perfectly terrible music. And the critics say, this man is a cacophonist. He is completely incompetent. And he said, did you read the reviews of Beethoven's first symphony when it was performed at Vienna? Now, the thing is, <laughs> we allowed one person, you see, one human individual to be the incarnate God. Because we have all been living in a theory of the universe in which the individual is simply involved in something that happens to him. And we feel that this thing that happens to us is reality. It is facts that we have to face and accept and cope with. See, it's always something other than you. You don't recognize it as an integral part of your own being, without which you cannot know what you mean by the word I. But in the truth of the matter is, though, that if uh, you will face it out, every single one of us knows that that isn't true. There is a, an, as it were, a recess of the soul, of the psyche, where everybody knows perfectly well that you are not just this irresponsible little mouse that's been chucked down into this world, but that you are really doing this work. You're running it. Only you can't admit it just in the same way as you can't admit that you're responsible for the way your own heart beats. You say, oh, that's not my doing. I have no control over my heart. Do you have any control over being conscious? Do you know how you will? And you say, I intend to take my hand down from my face and put it on my leg. I can do that, but I don't know how the hell it's done. So that what we mean by the capacity of voluntary control in the ordinary sense of the word is, is that we don't understand it at all. So you might say, in, in a funny backwards way, that the only kind of control you really understand is that way you're not using your will. Because you just do it so easy, like you open and close your hand. You know how to do it? Sure you know how to do it. 
but you can't put it into words and explain to someone how to do it. You say, well, come on, aren't you human? Don't you know how to open and close your hand? Just do it, silly. But we don't realize, you see, that just as we know how to do this, we know equally well how to turn the sun into light, how to blow the sky, how to blow the wind, how to wave the, the ocean, how to um, digest food, and um, I might add, to be digested by bacteria and transformed. As we transform our steaks, uh, we will in turn be transformed. Uh, but the, um, the pattern keeps going. And it's always you. Only you see you have this marvelous capacity to transform yourself without knowing that you're doing it. Therefore, you keep surprising yourself. And therefore, you keep on doing it. Because if you didn't surprise yourself, you wouldn't, go, you wouldn't go on doing it. It's just the very fact, you see, that you seem to be the victims of a thing you don't understand, and that you seem to conclude your life every time in a wipeout called death, where all your control goes. It's just exactly that opposite condition to what you call being alive that allows you to be alive. Only every time it happens, it's like it's new. It's like every time you're born, it seems like it was the only time. But of course, if it wasn't like that, you wouldn't do it.